Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and good day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Hazima Mozam and I welcome you all to ComStack UNESCO joint webinar on open science. Um, we, are, we are very grateful uh, and delighted to host our distinguished panelists today. Um, and also would like to thank them for their time and for accepting their, this invitation. We would be joined by Professor Dr. Zabta Khan Shinwari, who is the fellow of Pakistan Academy of Sciences. Um, um, along with him, we have Professor Dr. Shabazz Khan. Professor Dr. Shabazz Khan is a director and UNESCO representative to the People's Republic of China, Dem Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Japan, Mongolia, and Republic of Korea. Uh, with uh, with all these two gentlemen, we have Professor Dr. Claudia. Professor Dr. Claudia is a fellow of Brazilian Academy of Sciences and, and is uh, associated with the Institute of Computing, University of Campinas, Brazil. Um, with this, uh, I would request our first speaker uh, for today, Professor Dr. Shebaz, uh, for his lecture. But before um, he delivers his lecture, I would like to give um, you know a further introduction to him. Professor Dr. Shabazz Han holds Bachelor of Sciences in, uh, Science Honors in Civil Engineering from University of Engineering and Technology, Lahore. He holds a Master of Science in Water Resource Technology and Management and Doctorate in Civil Engineering from University of Birmingham, UK. Uh, Dr. Shabazz has worked in countries like Australia, France, and Pakistan in various research, consultancy, and policy positions. His work is widely recognized for example, through the receipt of UNESCO Team Award for Managing Hydro Hazards in 2009, Land and Water Australia Eureka Prize 2007, CISRO um, Medal 2007. In addition to that, uh, in 2008, Professor Dr. Shabazz joined UNESCO as the Chief of Water, Sustainable, water and Sustainable Development Section in the Division of Water Sciences in the National Science Sector in Paris until 2012. Um, currently, he is he is the director and representative of UNESCO in the um, in the countries like China, Mongolia, and Korea. With this, I request Professor Dr. Shabazz Khan for his presentation and lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Ms. Hazima Moazam, for a very nice introduction. Let me share my screen. I will be able to give a brief uh, um, introduction to this. Uh, topic and will be happy to take questions. As I said before, my only constraint today is I have another meeting in about one hour. So I will be focusing on UNESCO recommendation on open science, to which Professor Shinwari has provided many, many inputs on the way. And I will show you the process, as well as I will highlight why it is so important for the number of countries uh, including the ComStack countries. So open science uh, can be interpreted in many different ways, but today I'm going to talk about the open science as it is approved by the 193 member states of UNESCO. So it's basically under international law, uh, the definition, it's a recommendation as we say, which is an approved recommendation. So here you see two very important ladies and I, in UNESCO, uh, you know, we have uh, education, science, culture, communication, information, and social and human sciences. So science is a major area. On the left hand side, you see Madam Shamila, who is the assistant director general of natural sciences. And on the right hand side is our dear director general, Madam Audrey Azule. Uh, so this photo is taken in UNESCO headquarter. And during the pandemic, um, uh, the COVID, which we are still going through, open science was uh, one of the very important area which came through because if we want to solve big challenges like the COVID, then we must share our science. We should be able to share uh, our vaccines. We should be able to um, make solutions work together. For science to provide its full potential, we must bring together more cooperation beyond boundaries. Unfortunately, uh, still uh, there are scientific and digital divides which exist in the world. So open science came through during this time of the COVID-19 and there has been a lot of work which went into it 
there has been a very rigorous process to reach this level. So in the center of this diagram, on this slide, you see 17 sustainable development goals. So goal number one, like for example, there should be no poverty. To have no poverty, we need jobs, we need food, we need water, we need education. So for that, we need very good science as well. Two is about zero um, hunger. Three is about good health. You can imagine there is no good health unless we can deal with the pandemics as well as with the traditional diseases like diabetes and whatnot, and including the simple ones like diarrhea, we are still struggling with that. Quality education, uh, the gender equality, water, energy, and so on. I'm sure many of you know about the SDGs. To achieve these SDGs, we need quality science. If there would be no science, engineering, technology, and innovation, there would be no solutions. So that's where we need to be able to go beyond boundaries. Vaccine is a very interesting case. Unless we share the vaccines across the world, and if everybody is fully protected, only then we will be able to deal with this pandemic. So that's one area linked with health. But of course, there are many other areas like artificial intelligence, like uh, robotics, like um, areas of uh, science to help with better water management, areas of solar and other types of renewable energies, areas related to climate change. So that's the background that science must be open. But does this mean open access, like the open access journals? Not really. I will be able to show you Open science is a very comprehensive concept which has come through UNESCO. And of course, there is another very important recommendation of UNESCO, which is approved is on the ethics of artificial intelligence and Professor Chanwari has played a very important role there as well. So that's the idea that how do we solve global challenges, sustainable development goals through open science. So open science, what is it if it is not just the open access? So open science is about creating opportunities for increased scientific collaboration, sharing of information, sharing of benefits. Open science is about knowledge being openly available, knowledge being accessible, knowledge being reusable. For example, a, a scientist, a postdoctoral fellow, a PhD student, master's student, should be able to work across boundaries. For example, between Pakistan and Brazil, we have very eminent scientists with us, or with China, or in the, as you say, the countries in the North who have more knowledge and technology with uh, Europe or USA or others, uh, as well as the developing countries, small nations. For example, Timor-Leste, how can we make sure that we can have similar knowledge there as well? How do we open the scientific processes, knowledge creation? How do we evaluate science, communicate science, and how do we interact with the scientific actors, societal actors, as well as the holders of traditional uh, knowledge? So that's really the idea of open science. How do we bring a comprehensive approach to collaboration, to making science accessible, to making sure that we bring all types of knowledge together. And in this regard, there is open scientific knowledge, there is open scientific dialogue, there must be infrastructure to be able to work on science, like Pakistan Academy of Sciences is a very a great example, uh, which can provide a platform. We are working with the Association of National Science Organizations in China, uh, which is going to provide, for example, a platform for sharing data and for sharing publications and uh, many other things, open engagement of societal actors. So this is roughly, you can see the core of what open science should look like and how do we empower it. So open knowledge, making sure that we can um, look into publications, data, educational resources, software, source codes, hardware. So uh, a whole, you can say, um, uh, plethora of things which come with the, with the concept of uh, the open science. Open infrastructure, what is the infrastructure which should be open? 
the infrastructure, which can be virtual, which can be physical. For example, many scientists need access to labs where they can go and work on uh, the wet side of, uh, um, let's say, the environment, for example, an area very close to me, or the biological sciences, uh, they need access to many types of uh, equipment which may not be easily available. Or like in physics, for example, uh, the big physical experiments um, uh, which need a lot of infrastructure which may not be available to scientists uh, in the developing countries. So how do we make sure that infrastructure as well as the um, virtual platforms are available to students, scientists, to um, people who are trying to bring uh, better knowledge to their societies. Making sure we don't reinvent the wheel. The wheel has been invented already. We now need to put it into the vehicles we have. So that's the idea. So in a very simple way and making sure we have open innovation test. So UNESCO is very keen on promoting these ideas with our member states. So open engagement is also very uh, critical. That's where you know crowdsource funding, um, the crowdsourcing, uh, scientific volunteering. People may not have uh, to have a formal structure um, for being a scientist in one of the laboratories. A citizen science is citizen science open science? Yes, it is. But open science is more than the citizen science. Participatory approaches, uh, inquiry based uh, education. So many more of those ideas. Very importantly, it also recognizes the knowledge which is with the indigenous people. Um, there are marginalized scholars in countries where we come from. Uh, people are not given the proper respect while they may have the right kind of knowledge to be able to help move society forward on many of the issues. For example, environment, water, issues of food, issues related to uh, the many of the traditional medicines, for example, and of course, the role of the local communities. So with this uh, introduction, I can now maybe uh, introduce now that what UNESCO has tried to bring the core values and guiding principles, the actual recommendation, which is approved by the member states of UNESCO, if you search for it, you will be able to find the full text. So I'm just going to give you the gist of what is there. So it's built on some core values and guiding principle. So the core values are quality of, and integrity. An open access journal does not have to be lower quality. So the quality must be same as a, a journal paper in elsewhere or in Springer, but at the same time, the data and the paper is available freely. Uh, it should also be a uh, collective benefit for everyone, making sure haves and have nots, all of them are catered for. Equity and fairness is there, diversity and inclusiveness is there. So also, how do we connect these principles which are agreed by our member states to give it a legal value? Transparency, scrutiny, critique, reproducibility. So scientists accept it, government accepts it, also, the private sector accepts it. Equality of opportunities, responsibility, respect and accountability, collaboration and inclusion, flexibility and sustainability. So in a way, giving respect to science and scientists and making science available by linking people together, making data open, making methodology open and giving new opportunities for everyone to work together. So open science uh, has many areas of action and those areas of action include uh, um, promoting and sharing innovative approaches. I like vaccine is one, but there are many other types of science uh, which we are promoting, including for example, I gave the example of artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, test kits for the schools. So there can be many of those examples. How do we foster a culture of science uh, and uh, science is a very uh, particular way of looking into data hypothesis, understanding how you apply the principles of science, a common understanding, a policy which is shared, and investing in infrastructure and services, making sure governments invest into this area, promote South-South cooperation, countries uh, which are developing and countries which are developed, and very importantly, invest into human resources. 
So in this regard, the journey has been very interesting. It started um, way back in 2020. If you remember, we were uh, starting coming into COVID at that time. So that's where there was an establishment of an open science partnership. There was an open science advisory panel. There has been electronic consultations. So do, through this inclusive, consultative, responsible, and transparent process, we reached the recommendation on open science at the 41st session of the general conference in Paris last year in November. So the process is very drawn out. So why it took so long? It's not easy to agree on the principles which are agreed by all nations. And then once it is agreed, then this becomes a guide for how do we go about promoting open science. Now the academies of sciences, uh, the uh, private sector, uh, people working in government as well as NGOs have to be all part of it. So now the consultative process um, is a very detailed process. We have an open science advisory committee, which is drawn from the most eminent scientists around the world, uh, from all the regions. So not all from Asia, they have to be from Europe, they have to be also from Africa. Uh, so making sure we have the due representation and we received the global consultation with 2,900 inputs from 133 countries. And we also conducted regional consultations for Africa, Arab states, Latin America, and the Caribbean, Asia Pacific. I was the regional director for science and technology for Asia Pacific at that time in Jakarta. So I hosted the consultations for Asia and Pacific, and there were many, many interesting insights which came through. So in this inclusive process, we came up with thematic areas. We came up with stakeholders from a range of different uh, backgrounds, academies of sciences, science unions, uh, students, as well as their professors, as well as the government people, the libraries, data organizations, and very importantly, the United Nations system. So this is just one realization of um, a kind of mind map of what open science is. Uh, but of course, we have to come together with ideas from all over the world. How do we make sure that uh, open science is uh, founded on the solid foundations? It has uh, the right kind of ideas to be applicable to developing and developed countries and making sure that we do not drop uh, ideas like intellectual property, for example, and we continue to promote what is very important from intellectual property point of view, but at the same time, we make sure science becomes open very hard and we make sure we also engage with the industry. So that's the idea. And in this process, uh, what has come through, uh, through intergovernmental, intergovernmental means like uh, uh, governments like Pakistan, like uh, uh, UK governments like uh, uh, Brazil. So once they meet together, this becomes intergovernmental processes. Uh, the experts from the governments came together. They went through all the aspects, principles, core values, how do we apply? And finally, a draft was prepared with more than 100 countries and 65 observers working together. So what are the key challenges and barriers which we are very much aware? We have started from this year implementing open science. My office is very, very active in Beijing uh, with the Chinese Academy of Sciences and with the and so Dr. Shinwari is part of many of those uh, uh, discussions with ENSO, for example. Uh, so you are welcome to link with us on capacity building, which we are going to do. Like today's seminar is basically on capacity building as well. How do we actually have adequate infrastructure? How do we come up with the right kind of master plans for science and technology where open science uh, is promoted through better connectivity? What should be the incentives? How do we actually promote scientists in their professions and the academics, you know, the impact factors of the journals, whether they should matter or whether the sharing of data should matter, whether the service to society should matter. How do we make sure we have the right new kind of matrices for promoting people to go to the next level in their career as scientists? And also very importantly, as I mentioned before, what are the links between intellectual property rights and open science? How do we bring local and indigenous knowledge? How do we bring international solidarity? COVID has brought the world together and still we need more action. 
to have make sure there is a global good, the vaccine itself, the science is a global good. How do we bring international collaborations? How do we make sure the commercial mo monopolization of research data is avoided to make sure we get the long-term sustainability and we make sure that uh, there is a proper monitoring and evaluation. So it's accessible to all. The open science recommendation is fully available online. Uh, if you search the hashtag open science, you will find there is a website which I'm giving you here. You can download and you can see how can you be part of the open science. So with that, I do not want to linger on with my presentation for too long. I would like to give you a chance if anybody would like to ask any questions. I'm very happy to answer if I can. But very importantly, we have two other speakers who know this process very, very well, and they will be able to add a lot more value than my introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Shabazz. Uh, it was a very, uh, I would say, uh, interesting and comprehensive information for, for, uh, for a person who is not very well equipped with the idea of open science. Uh, with this, um, firstly, I would request our panelists, uh, Professor Dr. Zapta Shinwari and Professor Dr. Claudia, if they have any uh, input on your presentation or any question regarding it. Uh, Madam Hazima, may I suggest that we conclude all three and then we have a sort of a discussion uh, because there are several hands also. So the time limit, what uh, I recommend is uh, other, if Shabazz Khan uh, thinks otherwise, I have no issue. Uh, but I recommend if we finish three talks and then we have half an hour to, for discussion, that would be great. So Shabazz, what do you think about it? Uh, thank you very much, Professor Shinwari. Some my constraint is I have another meeting at seven o'clock in okay. about 40 minutes or less than that. So okay. I may not be available after seven o'clock my time. Let's spend 10 minutes on your talk discussion. Uh, so my, uh, I mean, uh, let me uh, open it for one or two minutes and then uh, Claudia and others, uh, Hazima can uh, moderate all other. My comments would be, to be very candid, Shabazz lecture was good enough. And uh, I am now a bit worried that uh, nothing to add to it. It's really quite concise and we are proud of him. He is foreign fellow of Pakistan Academy of Sciences also. There's another honor that uh, he carries and we are proud to have him on our board. Uh, and uh, soon we will be getting his services uh, or to, to, you know, help Pakistan Academy of Sciences. So my simple comment would be a uh, great idea. I will try to just add a few more words to this when I speak, uh, uh, inclusive society, little more democratizing science and citizen science and all those aspects. Otherwise, uh, I think this was a great talk. Uh, thanks to Comstech, Iqbal Chaudhary and Hazima uh, for organizing such things, and thanks for to Shabazz Khan for uh, agreeing to to be part of it. Uh, Hazima, you are right. Let's ask Claudia also to comment, and then you can invite a couple of questions also. Sure, sure. Okay, I just want to say very good morning because it's four o'clock in the morning here in Brazil, and I um, this was an excellent overview of very many concepts. And uh, um, I do not have any specific question, but what you have to imagine that you were listening to people who are different countries and you are also different countries. And we are all talking together, opening up our minds and collaborating and learning. And this is what open science is about. Thank you very much for this invitation. I just want to listen to questions and to the following discussion. Thank you very much, uh, dear Professor Shinwari and dear Professor Claudia for your appreciation. All of you have contributed. Uh, it's not something I have done. I am presenting what the world has done to come to a consensus within the United Nations system to open science. So certainly, uh, this overview and your inputs will help everybody understand how they can be part of it.
So I'm happy to take uh, questions as may be necessary, dear Hazima. Uh, so uh, first of all, you can see many compliments uh, regarding your presentation in the chat box as well. So I have one question uh, for you. Uh, according to your experience, which area of science do you think is fast-paced towards the concept of open science? Like, is it biological sciences? Is it like computer sciences? So basically, all areas of science need open science. You know, there are there is a um, charter of uh, human rights, and not many people know science is a basic human right. So, like, water is a basic human right. Education is a basic human right. We all should get educated. We should have the ability to get educated. Also, the human right, like uh, no fear from war. So similarly for science, science is a basic human right. This is what United Nations is working to make sure everybody gets access to science and technology and its benefits. So in my view, all areas of science are suitable for open science. We came through pandemic. Right now, vaccines are not available to many, many countries around the world. And this is a big dilemma. Uh, should we continue to promote vaccines, which are very expensive, um, and there should be investment of haves and have nots? So that's a biological science area. We, our focus is on vaccines because we are going through the pandemic. But also imagine, the science and technology, which is related to artificial intelligence, related to robotics, the uh, new internet of things, the areas related to physics, areas related to engineering, all of them need to be open for everybody to be able to learn. So this UNESCO is promoting many such things, including open education, open curricula. So open science is one of the efforts within UNESCO. We have programs. Uh, related to water, programs related to environment, programs related to geological sciences, programs which are for local and indigenous knowledge, and then basic sciences, physics, chemistry, mathematics. So in all those areas, we are applying open science as a tool to make sure the benefits of science reach everyone. Leaving no one behind is the idea. Thank you, sir. So I think here's a question for you from Dr. Saifullah. He's asking, is there any opportunities for, uh, for us to work with UNESCO? I think he's asking uh, particularly um, regarding your work in open science. You, you can work with UNESCO. I'm a Pakistani for your information and Australian too. So if I can work in UNESCO, you can work in UNESCO. So there are more than one ways. One is the secretariat where people like me are working. So uh, like uh, now I have a responsibility for the countries you mentioned. And Professor Shinwari is a very active contributor to UNESCO's program on the ethics of science. And uh, he's also a laureate of a very important UNESCO prize. So there are ways to work from outside. You can be working with the Academy of Sciences. You can be working with Comstech. UNESCO has a number of UNESCO chairs and many of them are in Comstack countries. So UNESCO chairs, UNESCO centers, we have many of those centers, including in many of the countries from where the colleagues are coming. Also, we have a very active internship program. To be an intern is very competitive, but you need to apply. There is an online uh, application process. You can link with the people. If you want to work uh, as a scientist within UNESCO, there are many jobs which are advertised but also education, science, culture, um, communication, information, social and human sciences. And there are more and more need for interdisciplinary knowledge and management skills. So there are many opportunities, including working on open science. If you want to work on open science, work with your Academy of Science, which may be near to you or through your university, and you can be part of it. Certainly there are many chances. And if you look through, we have more than 900 UNESCO chairs in the world. We are almost, more than 100 UNESCO centers. We are working with the academies of sciences from around the world. So there is a big UNESCO family. We also have UNESCO schools, ASP net school. So welcome. If you want to work in UNESCO, this is a wonderful idea. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
Thank you very much, sir. Uh, with this, I would again like to thank you for your time uh, and for you know for a very wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I will post my LinkedIn address. If anybody still have questions, they can post to me and link with me. So otherwise, I will leave at seven o'clock. I'm really very sorry for this uh, disruption. I look forward to the talks of Professor Shinwari and Professor Claudia. Thank you very much, Ms. Khalid. Thank you very much, sir. I'll forward them to our attending participants as well. Uh, uh, with this, uh, now I, I would request our uh, next speaker, Professor Dr. Zafta Han Shinwari, for his guest lecture. But before he, uh, he starts with his lecture, I would like to introduce him. Uh, Professor Dr. Zafta Shinwari is a fellow of Pakistan Academy of Sciences. He specializes in bioethics, preparedness and response, biosafety, surveillance, forecasting and due use of education. Professor Dr. Uh, Dr. Shinwari has also served in the private sector as a CEO of Karshi uh, Research International and a vice chancellor, um, uh, vice chancellor of PD uh, Karshi University Lahore. He is also a tenured professor. Uh, he was also a tenured professor of biotechnology and dean of faculty of biological sciences at Qaeda Azam University of um, Islamabad, Pakistan, which is one of the leading universities in Pakistan. He is also the president of National Council for Tib in Pakistan. He is, um, in addition to that, he has been awarded with the um, awarded with the civil awards that is Tamgha Imtiaz in 2012, Sitara Imtiaz in 2018. Now, while recognizing his efforts in ethics and science and technology, he has also been awarded with UNESCO award um, uh, awarded him uh, the Avicennia Gold Medal in 2015. He is also the focal person of Alliance of International Science Organiz organization, uh, Organizations um, in China from 2016 to 2012. Uh, with this, um, I request Professor Dr. Zapta for his talk um, on our current topic. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Hazima, for, for a great introduction. I'm really grateful to you. Uh, specifically, you are the force behind all uh, gathering all of us, and I'm uh, really glad. I'm grateful to both Claudia and Professor Shabazz uh, to be part of this group. It's great. Uh, Professor Shabazz, our foreign fellow, again, I repeat, and he, that way, uh, our, this, that shows our strength of Pakistan Academy of Sciences that we work on. Uh, I'm also really welcoming all the young scientists they are joining, listening us today. Uh, we are grateful to all of them that they, they, they are here. They joined us. Uh, so what I would be doing in the next 25 minutes will be adding something little more what Professor Shabazz was saying. In fact, he covered a lot of areas, but I will be more focusing on inclusive society. Uh, and if I take my first slide, that would be uh, science and inequality. You know, uh, when we talk about the world, the world is really divided into you know, the, those who have and those who haven't. And that is a problem in science too. Uh, and if you look at the, any society of the world, there are many citizens that are more talented, they, they're being sacrificed because of poverty, prejudice, poor schooling, and lack of opportunity. And if, even if they get to some level, then they face problem of uh, joblessness. And then they, if you ask them to publish something, uh, they are, uh, you know, the good journal will ask for $5,000 at least for one paper to be published. So there is that, uh, that we, we, we have to really uh, be working together. Uh, and as a scientist on this subject of inequality, we have to do a lot of work with our younger lot uh, to be, you know, address these issues of socioeconomic divide in the world that, that we are facing. I'm not going to talk all this because uh, Professor Shabazz had in detail said uh, just a little bit in pro about openness. That is free of caste barrier, free of permission. Imagine a world where you do something and you want to read something like Professor Shabazz said, education is a basic right of every human being. And I would take this education a little more to the research that every young researcher has a basic right to get access to any knowledge available in the world. But you cannot, because the journal will ask you to deposit such and such dollars if you want to get a, and even if you publish it. So it's, there are some people making money out of it even. Uh, you know, there's a big industry of publishing a multi-billion dollar. 
Uh, so that is where we really have to think how we can work uh, to, to that. And that is that we have to think global, but to address these issues as local, that we have to really, uh, and as uh, said by uh, uh, Dr. Shabazz, that I mainly work with UNESCO, Comesta, I remain its vice chair, which is Commission, World Commission for Ethics and Scientific Knowledge and Technology. So we, the integrity in science, because of this, you know, competition, this has been given a lot of problem with the plagiarism, falsification, uh, and fabrication, because everybody needs to publish a paper. And then to publish a paper, they do all means because they have to survive, like finding some job and all that. So integrity of science, and then solving the local problem, these are all linked to open science. And there is that uh, if uh, we have to have, uh, we already have some networks of integrity in all the area. Uh, but uh, I just quote you one example. For example, uh, Hazim asked a question, uh, the discipline that open science has to address. And well answered, but I give, I add to what Shabazz said, and that is the whole continent of Africa has no facility to produce vaccine for their people. They're always, you know, sort of a begging from the West to get some vaccines. For example, we signed the pandemic and Corona. So that is where you need, we are probably the same, same homo sapien. So for that, we need to have some kind of governance issues and sustainability from when we talk about open science from practice to policy, we should have some certain principles and we should realize that knowledge is a public good and right to research is for social justice. And that is that we, we, we have to know all this. And for this, you have to design policy of inclusiveness, of innovation, of funding, of infrastructure, of intellectual property rights, of incentives. You, 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 we all have to work as a whole. UNESCO is doing a great job, but then it comes to the local academies, the local education ministries, the local government to address these issues that we have to have, uh, you know, those open science claims. So it covers then what we need to do for policy options, which as an academician for me is science related arguments, financial arguments, social arguments, democracy related arguments, socio-political arguments. There is that you, you discuss all those issues as a participatory that you involve the society. And I, I, I would be stressing on few issues that whatever science we do, we should not be saying this is my project because I'm getting money, which is from a poor man tax that comes to the taxpayer, taxpayer pays to the government and then they pay me salary project and everything. So we all scientists, we are responsible back to the society that our science should benefit the society. And that is that we, uh, another slogan of UNESCO, science with and for society and their science, then we talk about now open science that there should be available science to the society, then they should argue about it. So, this will lead us for responsible research and innovation that we have to engage society. We have to increase access to the scientific. L look at your media, whether it's social media or print media or electronic media, you know, they, they are driving the humans. So what we need to do is that, uh, excuse me, if, they, if they, they are driving the media, so the misinformation in this pandemic had a great you know, concern for the scientific community, they deal it legitimize science because science was not easily accessible to the people. Nor scientists was that great to have, uh, you know, express their views to, to uh, the society. And there are other issues that we have to really address those issues. Uh, the career, the gender equality, I would call about gender equality, that equity for women, our women, they are great mind, but we don't encourage them to really, when I say we, I mean with the low and middle income countries where they, they feel a lot of issues that we have to really help them to come and work equal opportunities for them available. And then integration of uh, citizens, 
uh, formal and informal science education, access to the research results, governance, all these issues are the one that we somehow have to address and have this inclusiveness of the society for sustainable development. I will not be touching SDGs because Professor Shabazz already explained it very well, but whatever policy we make, it should be people-centered, inclusive, development-oriented uh, information society where everyone can create, access, utilize and share information and knowledge, enabling individuals, communities and peoples to achieve full potential in promoting the sustainable development. That is, that will improve your quality of life. If we consider human as one entity, so then we have to, you know, hand holding up those who are marginalized, those who are, you know, uh, have no access to food and uh, other resources. This will give you another word, which is called citizen science. If you look at the, 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 the last, uh, for, let's say 500 years. So the citizen science was initially as a, just to literate someone. This was education was a basic right or basic human right that we, that in early science was a focus. Then it, it, it uh, citizen science was diminishing from basic to high school. And finally it goes to higher education. And now higher education, what we need is science citizen science as open and inclusive science for the common good. But is it a common good? You, you are looking around the globe and this one pandemic, professors were under pressure, their, their salaries, their pension, their projects. We had a lot of issues that we were confronted with. So that is where we really need to, to democratize the research. And now when we talk about the democratization of the research, there is that you talk about creating institutions and practices that fully incorporate principles of accessibility, transparency, and accountability. Because if I'm getting money from the taxpayer, the poor man tax that I'm using it, I'm accountable to the society. That is that you have to really think this, that uh, you should consider the societal outcome of the research at least as a, uh, attentively as the scientific and technology output. That is that we, 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 we have to really think. Uh, the other very important issue is even if we, we on one side, we, we are advocating for open science to the young researcher, but others, on the other hand, we should also talk about misconduct because people publish and publish things that sometimes carry no value. Sorry to say that. There were a lot of analysis of the papers that were just copying. I mean, you you have a, I, I show a, a, a picture here to you that 10 people are sitting on a one tree and producing 100 papers out of this one tree. And now this red is, color is red of the apple and it's partially green and all this, but there also that we have to address. And this science should have impact on a society, positive impact. If science harms the society, I would say it's criminal if you, if the dual use of science now I'm talking about. That, that's also when we have open science on one science, uh, on one side, the opportunities. On the other hand, we should also talk about the challenges that we'll we will face when everything is open to everybody. Because there are people that can, what we call a dark side of the science is also there that, that, that we, we have. So if we work, for innovation and science, for sustainable development and inclusive society, interdisciplinary approach is a must. And that is that we would expect that the poor country, uh, low and middle income country scientists have an access to the higher income country or developed world that we could really, they could be trained, they could be, you know, have access to the resources and they could, uh, you know, work together. So there are various sustainable ways of this uh, extending this enterprise of science uh, for the nation, nation's help uh, and the principle and practice of open science could be transparency of data and method, reproducibility of research. This will promote, if you have access, you can reuse it and that will help. And then cumulative 
efficiencies where science, research tools and the output of research are combined to accelerate the delivery of new knowledge. That would really be a sort of help. Thirdly, uh, if scientists have enough time or the media could give them time, that would help us avoiding infodemic. Infodemic, the WHO director general was uh, really worried when uh, this corona was on the peak of misinformation, disinformation, specifically about the vaccines. Uh, so the, uh, not only vaccine, people got a, even minted money during this crisis saying this product is good, that product is good. They used it as a marketing tool to you sell their medicine, though that was not effective for Corona, for example. So though those are the issues that we do, we, we have to, uh, this uh, disinformation has to be catered. Uh, as I said, anti-vaccination movement, social media, misuse, mistrust on the government response then, stigmatization of those who were infected, uh, and exacerbation of existing political sentiments. But the most important, I call it, the delegitimization of science. People said, oh, they don't have any solution to this. Uh, we spent two years almost in a jail like this. So that is that you have to have some kind of a counter narrative. The third uh, that we should address the issue is the publisher parish uh, uh, approach, you know, that the, uh, you know, corruption in science. Uh, here there is a data of 1.3 million papers <coughs> on health, excuse me, in 2006, but actually the amount of knowledge that was created out of it was not of that, you know, uh, quality that they were there. So I would recommend that every senior researcher should be talking about research values. Uh, you know, the basic uh, principles, uh, honesty, objectivity, skepticism, openness, accountability, reliability, and fairness. If we, we, we do, we should be doing preaches of all this, the, the, that is. And if I uh, share with you a little bit of the data, as I said, this is a too materialistic world. 11% of the world article uh, in 2011 were published in fully full uh, open access journal. But the cost of the paper, if you look at here, $5,000 for author to pay. And sometimes you pay money and it is rejected. They say the you know process fee, $1,000, for example. So the revenue that generated was 9.4 billion US dollar. So there is that you, you, you have to really think about it. And then some students of the countries, they, those who are not having their English as their first language, they have to pay a lot of money to correct their, you know, uh, transcript. So these are all the issues. And this has given rise to a lot of predatory journals. Uh, so that is another issue. And sometimes your paper is rejected, yet you have to pay a lot of money. Uh, so the that is that the crime in academia has overtaken. Some people say even the bribery of our police departments uh, in the, some of the low and middle income countries I'm talking about. So those are the issues that we really, we all have to work on. Uh, why this happened? Because this, when you assess a scientist, an individual for his work, this measurement this, uh, you say impact factor, citation, H index, all blah, blah, blah. That gives rise, that, that, that forces them to publish whatever they have. And then uh, I, even if you get a, want to get a PhD degree, they say publish in such and such journal, otherwise you cannot get a degree. So that is another issue that we all have to really address. So if you have money, pay and publish anything. If you don't have money, you are a poor girl or a boy, wait, uh, you, 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 even if you have a good brain, you still will uh, have a lot of issues. So this disaster of the impact factor that we are facing internationally, we all have to really work on it, that how can uh, this pressure that is on the authors, on the editors, on the stakeholders, on the funders, that is that we somehow have to address and really work hard. I would be recommending to Comstack, Pakistan Academy of Science, and all others to come up at least for the national policy 
that they, they should look at the other issues uh, because if you want to publish something uh, of a national importance, why are you publish in a high impact factor in the West? Why not in a local journal? So that everybody has access to your data and could use it for the benefit of the nation. Here I give you one example of the vaccine. There was a who and cry from the scientists that why not for a while you, uh, you know, you give intellectual property rights to a poor country to produce their own vaccine. But then there, there was a lot of, uh, you know, regimes like uh, World Trade Organization. They had uh, some kind of, you know, agreement of trade related aspects of intellectual trips, what you call it. So the, the 10 countries had uh, uh, acquired 75% of the vaccines intellectual property. And as I said, the whole continent of Africa had an, not a single, you know, facility to produce a vaccine for human. So there is that you really have to uh, somehow uh, work as a human being, uh, not to, I would call snatch money from the poor, but somehow to help uh, the poor countries uh, to have, you know, uh, and now the, the, this is what is happening that uh, uh, Africa, uh, the, the continent of 54 countries with 1.2 billion people, they import 99% of its vaccine. So now they, they are planning for the next, uh, uh, you know, uh, 20, 30, 10 years that probably they will have some kind of facility available in their continent to produce some vaccines for the human being. Some good out of it is a lot of collaboration a lot of things that, 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 that people get, uh, got an opportunity that they can work together and they can, you know, share data. So this has given a kind of a hope for the people that they can really work uh, and uh, do something good. But when we talk about, you know, the poor country, the low and middle income countries, uh, they cannot find opportunities or money or resources to get trained. So they migrate and they, they go somewhere. And then if they go somewhere, there are data available. They cannot reach to the leadership role. Again, you know, uh, uh, the inequality, what I will call it, the prejudice the, the, within the citizenship. So there is also uh, we, what they call it global health is neither global nor diverse. We somehow to work and open science is a thing that that, that can really somehow uh, bridge somehow help uh, to advocate for vaccine equity uh, and the supremacy of the countries could be really challenged in a way that they can work so uh, there is that this may help open science to have a global vaccine manufacturing capacity to respond to pandemics not only this one the future, this was not the first and the last pandemic. Just as a science student, I could say that we could face many more. So we have to make ourselves ready to that. Uh, and if, if you, I just give you one example, the rich and the poor, uh, what, what the difference is that the proportion of people with COVID-19 who could die from the virus in developing countries roughly double than the rich country. If you are in a rich man, you have a chance to survive 50% more than the a poor man if you are a poor. So that is the difference of a human uh, with the resources that are available. Uh, so that, that by just quit because of time, I, I would be just uh, summarizing all this. I think I leave this to the Claudia who would be talking about the open science, uh, what recommendation we had given so uh, opportunities and challenges that they are available and recommendation, I am sure that she will be talking. So I'm quitting this, but I would be ready to answer if there were any question. But we have learned from this uh, need of open science from pandemic COVID-19, importance of timely and free uh, access of scientific data, publication and information, importance of science collaboration, and importance of science policy, society dialogue, and importance of human right to enjoy the benefit of scientific progress. Uh, this is some kind of, uh, you know, uh, not only why open science is very important, 
this is the uh, fake kind of me counterfeit medicine that is available everywhere. So if you have some excess, you may find something. For example, 27.5 million counterfeit medicine retained by European customs only. Uh, imagine how many have gone there. And then in Africa, 550 million doses. And so it's for, for so look at the others. We have a lot of fake medicine, fake vaccine, fake things that are available, counterfeit. We, we really have to work hard to, to you know, uh, stamp out fake clinical data even. They, uh, they have data of 10 people and represent 100 out of it. That is that somehow we, these are the issues that with these fraud that is being, uh, even in science, we have to really work somehow to catch this. I will conclude by think, saying thanks to Comstack, to the speakers, uh, Shabazz Khan and Claudia, uh, and all the participants. I'm really proud of all of them. Whenever uh, we have an event, they, they overwhelmingly join us, all these young ladies and uh, gentlemen. I'm really grateful. But I would be again talking about equity uh, and equality, equity for gender, female, in the developing country particularly that I would requesting that we would be focusing on. Thank you very much and over to Hazima. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Zapta. And uh, before it was an ex excellent and extensive uh, presentation, I would say. Uh, but before we go to question answer session for your excellent presentation, I would request Professor Dr. Iqbal Chaudhary who is joining us uh, for his uh, remarks and which have been into the topic, please. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Khazima. Thank you, Khazima. Rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Absolutely delighted to at least uh, catch the last part of uh, my very dear friend, Professor Zabta's uh, presentation. I feel bad that I wasn't able to attend uh, Dr. Shahbaz's presentation, but we do have this archive of uh, presentations, so I'm sure that I'll be able to benefit. Uh, I can see uh, house full. We have uh, over 250 people log in, and I'm sure that there are many more uh, in collective rooms. So this is a full quorum. Uh, in an international conference by all definition, because people from different countries are participating from different time zones. And this is exactly what Comstack uh, is, is, uh, uh, is actually striving to do, that bringing people from different countries and building their capacity. We're very proud to have partnership with UNESCO. Uh, Dr. Shahbaz is a great strength for us. He's a wonderful person and we are so fortunate to have his full support. This program uh, is uh, solely organized by Professor Dr. Zabta Shinwari, a very competent uh, world-class speaker on this uh, topic and certainly a very good friend of ours. I would just like to say briefly that, uh, see, I really feel this whole need of open science apart from what so many domain uh, connect to it uh, from transparency to uh, connectedness uh, from you know linking science with the society and one very important factor which has really emerged in the last few years is the cost of publication you are from a developing country and you wish to publish in a good journal and if you don't have money and you know, despite the fact that we have conducted a good quality science, you'll not be able to publish it. And this is so unfortunate because this put uh, uh, an extra uh, burden in impediment to the people who are already disadvantaged. So the cost of publication in many of these very high impact factor journal exceed $3,000, $4,000. Imagine how come on the face of the earth they would have this level of investment this level of money to pay for one publication. And that is an extremely unfortunate. There are so many ethical issues. You know, I review uh, papers and I do it free with, uh, with the feeling that I'm helping science. But when I try to publish something in a good journal, I have to pay. 
And this dichotomy of this publication really requires a fresh thinking. And that is where open science can also play an, play an extremely important role. So this is very timely, very important. I'm sure that this uh, event would leave lots of thoughts, lots of uh, points for us to ponder, discuss, and dialogue. I'm uh, very happy, I would like to, uh, uh, before we introduce, I think this is a time for us to take questions from Professor Zapta. Uh, and, and let me thank all of you for your very active participation. Excellent event organized jointly by Comstack, UNESCO, and my dear friend, Professor Dr. Zapta Shivar. Azima. Thank you very much, sir, for your time. And uh, we'll definitely go to question answers uh, session with Professor Dr. Zapta. Uh, we have some questions in the chat box. I will read them for Professor Dr. Zapta. So here is first question from Ms. Uh, Hirai Bal. She's asking, how can we convince young researchers to publish in a local general, uh, journal when even a single Pakistani journal is not in a W category of HEC uh, HJRS uh, list. Uh, thank you very much, Hazima. If you don't mind, because Dr. Shabazz has to leave, if he has anything to say before he says goodbye to us, uh, I request him to uh, to say a few words. If he he has another, I you know he's in Beijing and uh, looking after many countries of Asia Pacific. Uh, so, at my request, he is very kind to give us an hour. So Dr. Shabazz, over to you. If you have comment, then I will come to that question because that question is not only addressed to me, to Iqbal Chaudhary Sahab also, he's a dear brother of mine, uh, that we talk about Pakistani uh, you know, scenario, why not to publish locally uh, versus internationally? Uh, we will discuss this, but over to you, Shabazz. Huh? Thank you very much. Actually, I was in the process of writing a message to thank all of you and I was going to go. Actually, my appointment has already arrived. Uh, but very nice to uh, see Professor Dr. Iqbal Chaudhary Saab and uh, the Comstex leadership and the partnership with the UNESCO. We have discussed before, this can be one area where we can do a lot of collaboration and especially with Professor Zabta Shinwari's position as uh, uh, his uh, role, former role in UNESCO on the ethics of science and technology as the chair. And also with ENSO. ENSO is now going to be a very big player we are uh, formalizing a big partnership on open science with ENSO. So I have proposed already Comstec and ENSO uh, to be uh, working together with UNESCO. So there would be many, many things which we can do together. And to Professor Shinwari, always such a great pleasure to listen to you. And I saw many comments in the chat box. So they are saying you should be a professor. You are not only a professor, you are professor of the professors. So I give you this title today. So wonderful presentation. You have explained the concepts very clearly. And this issue which you have highlighted that uh, uh, poor scientists, poor students not being able to publish and Dr. Chaudhary have also highlighted. I think we need to work together. We need to create some endowment funds. Uh, open access is not that open access. There are barriers there as well. Your last diagram, rather than we lift people, we should get rid of the barrier and let them see the view. And that's really the purpose of the open science. We can promote it together. So I very welcome uh, our partnership and this work which will con continue and uh, also look forward to collaborating with Claudia in Brazil. And Chinese are very keen and the ENSO is very keen to work with you. We can do a lot of excellent work. Maybe we should set up a UNESCO center on open science together under the leadership of uh, uh, Professor Chaudhary. With that, I beg your um, uh, leave and I have to rush to my other meeting. Thank you so much, Professor yeah, Shimari. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. And with permission of Iqbal Chaudhary, Claudia and Hazima, uh, just to comment the question that was addressed uh, by one of my very good dear students, 
uh, regarding how can we publish in uh, a local journal when our higher education commission rates it WXYZ. Uh, of course, uh, I will, uh, you know, divide it into two. Once we needed, uh, thanks to our uh, Professor Atawar Rahman Iqbal Chaudhary, these kind of people who really work very hard to at least bring Pakistan on the map of the world, uh, that people re recognize that Pakistanis are doing good science. If you look at our progress that we are having in the last uh, 20 years, uh, that is a great, you know, uh, I, I feel proud of Pakistan, to be of this country uh, person that we did a wonderful job. Now, the, and this is not only a Pakistani issue that we talk about publishing locally versus internationally. This is a problem that now, as I said in my talk too, a disaster of impact factor and other issues. I expect that we now with the government, of course, this is beyond, uh, you know, uh, uh, of ours and other, this is a national policy that we will be working with different stakeholder. I'm uh, in touch and uh, we work together with uh, Iqbal Chaudhary Saab, uh, IS, uh, ICCBS and uh, uh, other, uh, we, uh, we, we are working, we will be working with the government with the HEC, HEC needs reforms, and we will be bringing such things that now patents and other issues for promotions, for your recruitments, for, you know, and publishing locally also, uh, addressing local issues. This needs government policy. And that is that we, we have to address this issue. We realize this issue. And this is not only Pakistan issue, please. I, I will be, as I said in one very brief two lines, that last two months even, every continent professors were demonstrating against these issues that they are, even Oxford professors were on the road because their pensions, their, you know, other issues were at stake. So it's not only in Pakistan. So we realize it. And uh, uh, the leadership, Iqbal Chaudhary Saab, my dear brother, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Atav Rahman and others, with the stakeholders, we should be taking this issue with the government, and we will be trying to have our next two decades addressing these issues that how can we really reform uh, our system that could help our younger people to address local issues and do research on our local problems. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, with this, there are a lot of compliments for you and your presentation, and there are people asking for your presentation um, to be shared with them. So we will be sharing them once we receive it from Professor Dr. Zabta through, our, uh, through the email addresses that we have of the participants. With this, thank you very much, sir, for your time and for wonderful uh, discussion. And again, I would like to thank you for being the focal person and for inviting uh, Dr. Claudia and as well as Professor Dr. Shabazz um, for this uh, very wonderful lecture. Uh, now I would request Professor Dr. Iqbal Chaudhary to kindly welcome and introduce our uh, next speaker, Professor Dr. Claudia uh, Madrus. Thank you very much, uh, Fazima. I wanted to introduce uh, all distinguished speakers of today's event, but partly stuck on uh, motorway, I was coming from Haripo, uh, but I'm sure that you have all benefited from excellent presentation of the speakers already. Uh, we now have uh, the last speaker of today, uh, Professor Dr. Claudia Ozer Medeiros uh, from Brazil. And uh, as we can see, the time zone is so different that her presence shows her commitment. And that is the universality of science. That is where we all link together with the common value of helping each other. Professor Claudia is a full professor of databases at the Institute of Computing University of uh, Champions, Unicamp, Brazil. She holds a degree in electrical engineering and master degree in computer science from PUC Rio de Janeiro. Brazil and a PhD in computer science from the University of Waterloo, Canada. For the past 20 years, she has been working as a visiting professor at the University of Paris, France. She has received Brazilian and international awards for research. So apparently she is in, uh, Claudia, you're in Paris right now, right? 
No, 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 I'm in Brazil right now. It's already time to start teaching. And I did not go to Paris this year. Okay, okay. and also for her work. Uh, so she has been internationally recognized uh, for her contribution and uh, for her motivation in fostering the participation of women in IT-related activities. Certainly an extremely important member of person who is uh, educating for right thing. And we are absolutely proud to have you on board on this very, very important. And looking forward to see you in Pakistan. So I would request Professor Zabta to set, extend a special invitation to you to visit us in Pakistan, in Islamabad, and be our, our guest, inshallah. Thank you very much. And over to you, Professor Claudia. Thank you so much, Dr. Chaudhuri, for this wonderful introduction. Let me start. Uh, just a second, I have to share my screen. Uh, good morning. It's still uh, five o'clock in the morning here in Brazil. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Good. So um, I'd like to talk uh, about, let me, let me just check this here so it won't interrupt me because I keep seeing all of you. Okay. So um, good morning, everyone, again. And this is what I'm going to talk about, uh, how open science helps creating knowledge through collaboration. And again, thank you so very much for the invitation, the two excellent speakers that preceded me. And just to say, this is where I come from, Brazil, the state of Sao Paulo, this is the state of Sao Paulo. That's the city of Campinas. That's the city of Campinas. And that's my university. Okay. And that's my university and that's the data I've worked with in my research. Okay. One of the messages I want to give you is that data is beautiful. Okay, and that we can do lots and lots of open science through sharing data. So I've worked with biodiversity, I've worked with agriculture, I work with clinical data, I work with noise data, I work with bird songs. I am a computer scientist, but my world is data. And this is how I collaborate, I collaborate through data and um, we've already had two wonderful talks about the principles of open science, public good. It is open and it's science. And how should science be open? We have to think that science and scientific process should be open when you design a project, the design should be public. The whole set of steps throughout the execution of a project should be open. The results should be open so that it can be reproducible and reusable, which is what is behind enhancing and augmenting results, the reuse, okay? But also under ethical and legal constraints, which both of, uh, the people who preceded me talked about. So, um, and they emphasized why open science, okay? Lots of people are now talking about it because with openness, people can collaborate without boundaries, geographic boundaries, temporal boundaries, cultural boundaries. Just look at us here and how to enable this collaboration through sharing. And there's this sentence that's very often used because it's not that you have to open everything. There are ethical constraints. There's privacy to be protected. So there are all kinds of constraints that we should not open everything, but open as much as possible. I'll talk a little bit about it. 
And I'd like to go to the etymology so we can think about what we're working on. There are two very important things in open science. The first is sharing, and the other one is collaboration. Sharing, uh, the etymology, zero in Old English, that gave origin to scissors, shears. So share and compartial in Portuguese, which means cut and, and distribute the portions, which is the same uh, etymology as French, part. Okay, you have a big cake and you share it by cutting it and dividing it. And um, in Urdu, I'm very sorry, I try to honor the country where I am right now, virtually. So I, I, I learned that it's Bantna, related to pass around, collaboration. Co, labore is Latin, and it means work with. Or in German, it's the same thing. Arbeit is to work and zusammen is together. And in Urdu, okay, I know I'm right because I checked it, okay? Um, it would mean also join forces. So these are the two main keywords related uh, with open science. One is to share and the other is to collaborate. And through sharing and collaboration, we advance science. So we share and collaborate, but not only now. When you are producing knowledge, you are also sharing with the future. Okay, so who are we sharing and collaborating with? We do not know. Because maybe the people that will reuse our work have not been born yet. Okay, so how do we organize and open what we are doing so that people we will never see, maybe are not even born, they can reuse and increase knowledge. And of course, across continents, regardless of culture, that's very, very complicated. So the, this figure is the essence of open science. This is the implementation, in a sense, you make the results, the processes, everything associated with your research available, open in repositories. And you collaborate through sharing these, this is a computer science view, okay, such as implementation. You share what's in repositories. And by doing this, you collaborate. So, uh, but this is the sharing. This is a collaboration. And people are the key in this. So, uh, because in computer science policy, so how are we going to enable this? How, how are we going to enable openness? So all results and processes of scientific research are made available in public repositories, such as publications, such as data, software, code, and hardware specifications, because as you know, lots of hardware comes from code that's executable, for instance, to produce chips. And if we think of a world scenario, there you are, lots of repositories connected through the internet and accessed by people and that either collaborate directly in a one-by-one -one basis in a lab or indirectly via sharing and, and exchanging and reusing and people are the key. So when you think about open science, 
think that, first of all, it's science. Okay, so it has to be sound, it has to be good, it has to be ethical. It's open, which means that everybody can see and reuse what you have done. And, but it's mostly about people. So when you work with someone, you have to adapt to that person and the person has to adapt to you so you can join forces. Now you have to think about working with the future, with people who are not born, but contribute to them. I'm going to, at the end, show an example of what we are doing in Brazil so it becomes more concrete. So I'm going to use a figure from this report, which I helped uh, write. And the figure uh, is this. You have at the center of open science, you have a community of people that share their research activities, their research outputs. And as you share, you improve and contribute to the sharing and to the production of results. And you have, afterwards, you can look at the report and you have the guiding principles of the sharing. You have the enabling factors capacity building, culture change, facilitators. So if you have, you have scientists, but you have the whole population here, you have policy makers, you have funders, you have educators, technical staff. And in the end, lots of people, when they talk about open science, they talk about physical infrastructure. You have to have the labs, the facilities, the internet. And who does open science benefit? Science, technology, innovation, but society as well, as was mentioned before. And the guiding principles, a very important thing. You work and you collaborate with who you trust. How can you trust uh, the science of someone else to reuse it? equity, inclusion, and so on and so forth. This was mentioned by the speakers before me. So let me give you some concrete examples from the past and how we still use them to produce science. This is the diary of a Dutch person who wrote every day he woke up and wrote, today is cold, today is hot temperature, weather conditions. This is being used today on climate change studies. This is an example of the past helping the future in when he produced his diary, he never imagined that it was going to be used in something that he never even imagined existed before, okay? The other very interesting example is this biologist in the United States who 143 years ago came up with an experiment that he would put bottles with seeds. He would bury them and every 10 years, someone will come get a bottle and try to see which of these seeds have survived. So last year, a bottle had a 142 year old bottle still had 11 seeds. And they are studying this as to chemical processes, lots of other scientific studies he never imagined. But he prepared the whole experiment to last and very, that's this person. Imagine yourself in 150 years producing science for the future. And that's the bottle uh, of a today scientist. And she and her group are preparing the continuation of this experiment for the next 100 years. 
for new kinds of studies like genomics, that's a bottle retrieved. And when you were talking about where should I go to, I would like to recommend you check the Research Data Alliance, and uh, which is an alliance of over of people. It's free. It's open. That talk about how to share and produce data. Go in the internet. You can just affiliate yourself to it and collaborate with people all over the world. I am an RDA member, and lots of the things I've been talking about and I'll talk about, I have learned through RDA. One small, uh, almost final comment. What does it mean to implement openness? Openness does not mean that you are going to share everything. It means that you can find if this thing exists. And you can afterwards talk to those or get documentation. And you may or may not be used, uh, may or may not use it freely. Because again, as I said before, privacy reasons, for instance. But the metadata that describes the objects has to be open, okay? So open science, how to implement it? Okay, I know I'm going down to computer science, but I'm a computer scientist, right? You implement it by opening metadata. And I, if people do not have, I mean, some of you may not use the same word, Metadata is a descriptor. When you buy medicine, it's the label so that you can find it. We do not buy medicine going to a drugstore and drinking every bottle. Okay, you look at the label and you know what's inside. And there's the final notion of reuse. What does it mean to reuse? You can reuse by reusing parts and constructing the whole thing. Or you can reuse by using parts and constructing things that whoever produced it had never imagined. As an example, and this is what I'm going to talk about, how much time do I still have, please? Do I still have five minutes? Yes, Claudia, please go ahead. Five minutes, you can take five minutes. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you. So um, I'm working with a very big COVID clinical data, open data repository. So it can be used for data analysis, produce papers, but, and, and, and vaccines. But you can combine it with socioeconomic data and decide when schools should be open, where. So this is reuse for what it was intended to do, produce science. But this is reused to other purposes, which are also very uh, good. So let me give you a brief example. I um, am uh, a coordinator of a program on e-science and data science at a very big um, funder called FAPESC in Sao Paulo. And I helped to coordinate the creation of a federation of open data repositories. Uh, this, by the way, is my university, but these are other universities. And this is one of the first uh, federations of open scientific data repositories in Latin America, okay? And each of these universities produces its scientific data and makes it open in the repository. All the metadata, the descriptors, are exported to the world and um, then people who want to find out what these universities are doing can go to this portal, get the data, and connect to the researchers. 
okay? And it was designed to be open and expensive. This took three years and about 100 people to construct. And it was inaugurated at the end of 2019, okay? And it serves 48 campi and about 200,000 students. So what happened in 2020, COVID arrived. And because this was designed to be open, uh, the Sao Paulo FAPES State Foundation was able to create and, and fund in a matter of two months only, a very big COVID repository that is open to the world, okay? With hospitals and clinics, private and public, giving open data for researchers. It's open to everyone. It's been anonymized, it's been cleaned, but it's data about 800,000 patients, not only with COVID, anybody who, had a COVID test, okay? And it has they, uh, uh, over 50 million clinical records. And since June, 2020, it has been get, gotten downloads from 36 countries. And examples of results of using these data, research related to health. Of course, research related with artificial intelligence, because you have 50 million curated clinical records, anonymized from 800,000 Brazilian people. It's not, as I said before, it's not only COVID data, it's data from anybody who had a COVID exam, and then all of their exams, blood, urine, you name it. And it's continuously updated. So uh, this is an example of the users. It's data, you can publish it. How can you, for instance, in Pakistan, or you were listening to me, uh, publish, publish your data, make it available make it known, make it open, and you'll be able to collaborate all over the world through data. So this, using these repositories fosters international collaboration, but there are huge technical problems I'm not going to talk about, about implementing and making this work. And uh, I leave this question to everybody. This is a way of building international bridges, sharing. How can we build them? How to overcome the implementation barriers? How to overcome the cultural barriers? How to overcome the inequalities that exist? And I end up here with these questions. Thank you, Gazima Wazim, who helped me a lot with learning Urdu, okay? Uh, she taught me the two terms I use today, and maybe I'll continue learning when I go to Pakistan, thanks to your very nice invitation. This is my email. This is thank you in Portuguese, and feel free to contact me. Thank you. Let me stop sharing, and I finished. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Thornia. And actually, I would I should be the one thanking you for your time and for waking up early this early in the morning. Uh, and uh, I would I like to thank you again. I'm sorry if I mispronounce the Urdu words. You are to blame. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, we should not do this. It's not polite. But we you, all know the teacher is to blame. Okay. <laughs> you actually pronounce them uh, very rightly, so actually I don't have anything on me for this, <laughs> thank so you. thank God. And again, thank you very much. It was an excellent presentation, and there are a lot of comments uh, regarding your presentation in the chat box. 
Before I take question answers from the participants, I would request uh, Professor Dr. Zabta and Professor Dr. Iqbal for their comments and feedback. Over to you, sir. Senior, first, I ask Iqbal to first say something <laughs> that I would... no, no, Please go ahead. Okay, uh, just, just a couple of sentences. Uh, 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 Professor Claudia led us with our uh, working group on open science uh, of IAP. I was part from ASA, Asian Academies, and uh, uh, she did a wonderful job of accommodating mm -hmm. views of all of diverse people. Uh, and this presentation today, I learned many things from her again. Uh, so thank you very much, Claudia. And I can imagine you are uh, waking up from the midnight to in the morning. Uh, that's your, uh, you know, great favor to uh, to the whole world. I would say we, as Iqbal Chaudhary Saab said, we have more than uh, more than 250 people listening. You and they are from Palestine, Palestine, from uh, Central Asia, from West Asia, from many countries, from developed world. So they are all fond of you, and this is because of you. I'm really grateful to you. Uh, your explanation was very good, uh, excellent. Every word you focus on was great, uh, but the credit goes to the leadership here, Iqbal Chaudhary and his team, uh, who really managed this uh, well in time. So over to Iqbal Chaudhary to kindly uh, say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Professor Zabta. And I'm absolutely delighted that uh, I was able to reach Islamabad and to listen to both of you. Absolutely impressed from the quality of the presentation made by uh, Professor Claudia. At the same time, her uh, attributes. You see, we often have knowledge, but we require that particular global outlook. Uh, people like Professor Claudia are actually global citizens because they are there to help the entire community of scientists and researchers. And that is the spirit which means uh, a lot. And when she was presenting her excellent uh, presentation, I was actually thinking how to expand this work. Uh, Professor Dr. Shahbaz already mentioned that uh, we should follow it up and certainly this is a topic in which we need to have a serious follow-up. And I was thinking how to bring uh, Professor Claudia to Pakistan and lots of younger people from here and also in OIC member states to uh, Islamabad to have a very large international conference followed by an OIC Society for Open Science or a Pops like UNESCO Center for Open Science. And at that point of time, I thought of leadership of you and Professor Zabta to take that initiative to the next phase. Uh, this uh, even should not only really end here. I think this is the beginning of an extremely exciting area. For many of you, this is a new concept, but this is the useful concept, an extremely timely one. And the examples given by Professor Zabta of how open science help has helped humanity and saving uh, lots of life during the pandemic. And this accelerated growth of understanding of open science proves the concept. So hypothesis, the concept is very well established and it's all on us to take it to the next level and make sure that this uh, wonderful uh, concept of equity and inclusiveness uh, receives all over the world, especially where it is needed the most, the least developed countries, and many of them are unfortunately in the OIC region. With this, I would like to thank you all and uh, look forward to have many of these follow-up activities. And for that, I'm so grateful for the leadership of Professor Dr. Zabta Shiva and to my colleague, Fazima, for a wonderful and very efficient organization of this event. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, with this, uh, just a last question that has been posted in the chat box. So uh, we can take um, comments from Dr. Claudia. Uh, so here is Mr. Uh, Vakas. He's asking, all the quality work published are in paid journals. How can we take advantage from their work? So I think you can suggest him on general terms what can be done. Um. 
should I say, uh, do you want me to start or, or Professor Zabta, who, who starts? Uh, when uh, you can start. Uh, request Claudia, uh, was, uh, mainly you now the leader of the, our own team. You are teacher of all of us, so please oh, go. No, 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 I don't, the teacher, you know, as I said, the teacher is always to blame, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And we learn, we learn through teaching and vice versa. So we all teach, all of us. Um, this is a continuous issue uh, between those who have the, the, the money and those who have not, and those who have access and those who have not. And through publications, uh, reach the world. The, the first thing, uh, and, and by the way, I, I'm, as I said before, I'm a data person, okay? So there's also this inequity about data. Those who produce the data sometimes are not those who benefit from it. There are several examples of, of how the, the more developed laboratories and, re and big groups of researchers will uh, take advantage of the data that's produced in less developed regions and uh, sometimes produce knowledge that's closed. Okay, so it's not just a problem of not being able to publish. Uh, you are not being able to have your work you are not able to have your work acknowledged. And um, the only way to do it, there are so many ways. This is all very expensive, okay? It's a matter of economics, but there are two ways to, I see, to decrease this inequality. The first is reach out to, uh, through, reading and to collaborate with other uh, people through the, when you read their papers, you, ask, you talk to them, you collaborate and you can be a co-publisher, okay? You publish with them, you become known and then people will come to you to collaborate. So you create this ecosystem. The second, I'm going to tell you a story from a person I met about five years ago. I don't know who she was. She's a researcher in my university. And since I'm obsessed by data, whenever I sit with someone I don't know, I ask that person to tell me about their data. Talk to me about your data and I'll know who you are. Okay, that's me. And she told me the following story. She had published a, an Excel um, spreadsheet with data on trees that she was working with here in Brazil. Diameter, height, whatever. And since she published that data, she was contacted by a group of British researchers who were interested in that data and wanted to work with her. And she told me, do you know what? My research in Brazil today is being financed by the United Kingdom because I published a, a spreadsheet with a diameter of trees. It was not a paper, okay? Uh, it was maybe a paper that referenced the data, but she got to collaborate because she exposed her data. And there, are, so there are many ways you have uh, countless examples of very great research that you are doing in your region, we are doing in our region, that can be exposed through openness and unfortunately not necessarily through publications and expensive papers. So I'll stop here and um, I'll let um, my colleague continue about this. Think not just about papers, okay? Think about data. Think about software. And think that 
every one of us has unique knowledge that can be taken advantage of for collaboration. I've stopped. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam. Over to you, Dr. Zapta, for your input. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, 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 as I said, when Professor Claudia speaks, so she speaks on behalf of all of us, wonderful explanation. Uh, I would just add that, uh, uh, you know, I'm already uh, also reading the chat box. People are saying that for their PhD, they need papers, uh, publication fee, uh, all this. Uh, we know all this. I mean, we we came through this process uh, and this low and middle income countries, particularly from uh, where I come from. Uh, we know the problem, the issues that they are confronted with. And when they get a degree, the joblessness and other issues are also related and integrated with all of this. Uh, but what we, what, what, in addition to whatever Professor Claudia said, I would recommend that you know, we, we have to really work and, you know, uh, 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 hammering and uh, knocking the doors of the policy makers uh, to do something. Uh, in our country, Higher Education Commission earlier, I want to say the, just the five, six years back, there was a system available of, of Pakistan Science Foundation and uh, HEC that they were uh, helping partially to publish the papers. Uh, and sometimes the universities were also, some of the universities were now. Unfortunately, I'm not going long, but this is a new liberalism policy, what I would call it higher education tourism also, that people consider higher education not as a, a for public good, they consider it as a luxury sometime. So, you know, uh, the and poor countries, they cannot afford the, the parents uh, to, uh, to, you know, educate and they have more, even in their house, the population uh, tsunami, what I would call demographic uh, early to a uh, country like us, we have more children than the developed world. There's another issue that we are confronted with. But what I assure you is that the leadership, the senior leadership of scientists in the country, Pakistan, uh, uh, Iqbal Chaudhary, Atau Rahman and others, they all are working hard and raising these issues with the relevant quarter, and we will be doing that. So great, and over to Fazima if there is anything she wants to summarize because we have, and I'm worried for Claudia, she is, you know, not sleeping for the last, you know, whole night now. So let's uh, conclude in next 10 minutes so that she could take rest. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, with this, now I would request Professor His Excellency, Professor Dr. Ikmal Chaudhary, Coordinator General Comstech and Director ICCBS for his concluding remarks. Over to you, sir. I think the only thing which I would like to say at this stage, uh, good night, uh, Claudia. Have a nice sound sleep for a few hours. And, uh, <laughs> and when you wake up in the morning, you remember us because there's so many things which we are looking forward to have from you including a dedicated program for women in science. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, with this, we come to the end of our session today. I would like to, on behalf of Comstech, I would like to thank our distinguished speakers today, and as well as our participants who joined us. And I would especially like to thank our IT team at ICCBS and Comstech for their full support. And we hope to see our participants in an, another session of Comstech. Thank you very much and bye-bye. I just like before you finish. Go ahead. Okay, so let me start again. Um, I would be very glad to collaborate with, in particular, computer scientists. Okay, uh, who are maybe there's none here, but do email me. Okay, uh, there are possibilities for visiting scholars to work here, fully paid. If computer scientists want to come and work, do contact uh, me, please. And um, it will be a pleasure to go to Pakistan, okay? And I'll ask Hazima, okay, and Zabta as well, and you, 
to teach me a little bit of Urdu so I don't get lost and understand everything. Okay. But so thank you so much again. This was an honor. I, I learned a lot and I'm looking forward to uh, strengthening our collaboration. I'm not going to sleep. I won't be able to sleep. It's six in the morning and now I'm going to have breakfast. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you very much, madam. It would be a pleasure to have you here in Pakistan. And with this, thank you very much and bye-bye.